Hi there everybody, welcome to this week's show. Before we get started, I just wanted to uh, jump in and let you all know about a couple of learning events that I've got coming up in the new year. Um, there's the uh, Future of Coaching event, which I'm, uh, I'm, I'm running in, in partnership with uh, Sud America Coaching, uh, alongside Mark Bennett, um, John O'Sullivan, and a number of other special guests that we haven't announced yet, but uh, they'll be coming for uh, shortly. And that's happening in uh, just after the new year on the 4th of January. So I'm very excited about that, and it should be a really exciting uh, and, uh, and fun event to get together with some colleagues and share some thoughts and ideas. And then also uh, with the kind help of uh, the fantastic guys up at uh, Stuart's Melville's College in Edinburgh um, have an event which we're calling the Talent Equation Live where uh, again I'll be uh, joined by uh, colleagues such as uh, Russell Earnshaw and John Fletcher from the Magic Academy. Uh, Mark's coming, he follows me around everywhere obviously and then uh, some other fantastic speakers such as Danny Newcomb and Sarah Kelleher from, uh, from the World of Field Hockey who've got some fantastic and exciting stuff to share around cultures and environments. So um, that's happening on the 29th of January so hopefully we can see, I'll see you at one of those events uh, and and uh, I look forward to uh, to meeting you and uh, hopefully learning together. In the meantime, I'll uh, I'll I'll let you go for this this week's show. Uh, exciting conversation with Sam Jarman. Be uh, be prepared. Uh, we really get into some heavy concepts here, so it's one of those ones where you really want to be having your thinking caps on. Um, I'll, I'll anyway. I'll uh, I'll leave you to it and uh, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better, faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, this afternoon, looking forward to this conversation, I have um, a good friend um, who... I, I like certainly would like to would like to call a friend anyway. He, he might have a different idea. Uh, Sam Jarman is with me. Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stuart. No, you of course you can call me a friend, mate. I uh, yeah, we're all we're all friends. We're all friends. Good, good. So uh, this is actually part three um, of a uh, I'm going to call it a um, a saga, a trilogy. I don't know. Um, uh, we've had a, a conversation uh, on a patio. Uh, at a golf course, um, which um, was interrupted by several people, um, which was a kind of initial initial conversation. We've had a conversation whilst uh, walking the manicured fairways of Woburn Golf Club, uh, which I was very fortunate to join you with um, and, uh, and and participate with Daisy, the best behaved cocker spaniel I've ever known, I've ever met. <laughs> um and uh, so this is part three the actual recorded version which we've um been threatening to do for some time so i'm really glad to have you on i guess the starting point is um i, I the story i think is probably the useful thing in terms of given given me the context and the background around kind of how you've arrived doing what you do really which is kind of a bit like not not a normal journey and also kind of what you do is a, is very difficult to describe so i'd be really interested to hear what uh, what it's all about Okay, mate. Um, so I'm, I'm a golf professional golf coach, um, did my PJ training. So, um, played full time for best part of 10 years as a, as a sort of decent amateur. And then as a, as a, a, a pro, um, playing on the mini tours. Um, and it got to the point where I realized I wasn't going to make any money playing. So, um, decided to go down the coaching route and just once I started helping other golfers it, it just became clear to me that the stuff I'd been bumping into in terms of my own playing career that is performing 
my the stuff I knew I was capable of when I really wanted to produce it. Um, they were struggling with that as much as I I, I had done. So um, I started to, to to take what I'd learned about the mental side of the game when I was a player and explore it more deeply as a coach. Um, and just as I say, realised that what we were what we were talking to golfers about in terms of trying to control their thoughts and feelings, um, trying to manage their state of mind, um, trying to manage focus and concentration just just wasn't working. No, nobody that I found could 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 do it. Um, so as I say, started to learn more about it and, and sort of stumbled on a, on a very different understanding about how, how the mind works, how the human experience is created, which, which just made a lot more sense um, to me in, in, in both my own golf and in my, in my coaching and also in the, in the people that I, that I spoke to. So um, I started sharing that with golfers and then that, transitioned in sharing it with with other sports so I work with um, rugby players rugby coaches cricketers footballers um, and also starting to share this now in in some businesses and in some schools as well so um, the you know the, the the understanding that we that we point to is, is universal it doesn't matter whether you're a coach a player um, whether you're working in an office, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a student, whether you're five years old, whether you're 105 years old, um, what what we're pointing to is the same thing, which is, I think, why it resonates so strongly with with the people that 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 see this, because we're pointing to something that's true about all human beings, rather than pointing to um, something that's personal um, that might work for one person and, and not for somebody else. So I'm interested and I've always, I, I find myself always asking this question. Most people that come on the show, I kind of, I find, kind of have this interesting thing. So you said in your story that, you know, you were working as a professional, well, you, you were a professional golfer and then you decided to sort of step away from professional golf, go more into coaching. And, and also you, you wanted to take some of the stuff that you'd learned about with the, the you used it in I'll inverted commas, mental side of the game to explore this, 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 this different area. So I am, I'm assuming like most people, there was almost an, a moment or a, an epiphany that kind of, um, or a crisis perhaps uh, that, that sort of, led you down this path um it seems that that that's a that's a a recurring theme with people i speak to on the podcast is that is that true of you yeah i think so um i mean i i wasn't i i wasn't in a great place when i when i kind of stumbled on 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 this understanding i you know i i i i kind of finished playing um my my relationship wasn't in a great place. Um, wasn't quite sure whether coaching was what I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I, I wasn't in a good spot personally, but I'm not saying that that's, you know, you don't, it's, you know, it, it's a bit of a coaching cliche that you have to hit the bottom before you can kind of start going up again. And I, you know, that's not true for a lot of people. I work with some people have, have you know, have been in really good places when they've seen this and, and this is kind of, help them to understand why why they've been successful at, at whatever it was that they were that they were doing so um yeah you know the 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 zero to hero stories you know a, a, a great story and it's um you, you know it can be true for a lot of people but i don't think it's it, it's not exclusive yeah i i know what you mean um so essentially then there's a there's a scenario of um playing um kind of maybe not getting as getting where you probably would have liked to have got to there's then a kind of i suppose is that part of a fuel in terms of a uh, a search for uh you know i'm not going to say answers but you know there's there's a there's a searching component here around helping others because i know that's certainly a huge motivator of mine one which is partially linked to being born with a disability, partially linked to, um, you know, striving and driving as, you know, as an able-bodied 
an able-bodied athlete uh, with I didn't know any different you know um, but also then this this drive to sort of help others uh, guide uh, get others that's definitely part of my why I guess um, it, did that help you with that search is that is that sort of partly where what took you into this world I, I guess so um, I mean that's what that's what human beings do and that's kind of what I'll hopefully we'll come on to a bit later is that the you know for most people the human experience is one of either seeking something or resisting something yeah so um we're we're all we're all on doing that to a greater or lesser extent um i I, to me the the performance element of it has kind of dropped away as i've got into the the coaching side it's it's more about why 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 wasn't i enjoying golf uh in the way that i had as a kid and why aren't a lot of the athletes that i work with now why why aren't they enjoying their sport in the same way that they were when they first started getting involved with it and i think that 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 as coaches is a a a more I want to say productive, but that kind of counters my own argument. It's a more it's a more fruitful area to look at, um, particularly that most I think most coaches are probably working with aren't working with elite athletes. They're working with with either kids or or in in grassroots sport and and um, helping helping people understand why why they enjoy a game one week and then not the next is. It is a great way of getting into understanding themselves more deeply and also understanding the people that they're working with. Um, cause, cause that's at the end of the day that if you want to go back to the seeking and resisting things, most people play sport cause it, it feels good. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why we do it. They seek, they're seeking, they're seeking happiness. Um, so, so understanding that is, is key. And if we can, point people towards that um rather than this idea that winning is is what will make us happy then then i think certainly at the well at all at all levels it's it's a little bit more um probably confused at the top end but certainly with 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 most athletes and players if we're enjoying the game then we're going to perform well anyway so um that I think is a, is a, is a better direction to look in. So one of the things I know that you've talked about in the past is um, we'll sort of drill into the, I guess the central thesis of kind of wh- where you're, where you're, where you're coming from in terms of the way you, I guess, engage others and then help them on this sort of, um, you know, journey. I mean, you were kind enough to send me um the first volume i know there's another there's another one in the pipeline and probably another one in the pipeline as well <laughs> it's a long pipeline mate yeah because <laughs> you're, you're a prolific writer um i think you've start you've opened up a pandora's box and now you can't stop um and i mean i'm envious because i've been threatening to write a book myself for some time but i've never quite got to that point but anyway so you were kind enough to send me your your first book and there were some really interesting ideas and thoughts in there which i'm interested to get you to expand on a little bit more um but just on that i mean one of the things that really resonates for me is um and i know a lot of people who've spoken to me about this is this idea of you know outcome being um you know kind of very important to people in terms of their you know their perceived happiness and you know i know coaches for example are happy if their team achieves an outcome and are un- unhappy if their team doesn't and their relationship and the player's experience of their coach is wrapped up in that so you know players are fearful if the outcome isn't uh, matched up to the expectations of the coach and they are unhappy as well although I think they're less unhappy than the coach would be um, <laughs> at least at least my son's experience of football <laughs> recently he just really five seconds later didn't, yeah. didn't care they were playing on the screen Mate, and, and that's 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 where we you know your your kids got it right maybe the coach that's wondering about the result for another three days and and stewing on it as as maybe not seeing things as clearly as 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 kids do and we see that in you know you, you only need to go to a 
a, a mini rugby festival or a, a kids football tournament to see that that's true. You know, the kids are playing because it's a fun thing to do. It's an expression of happiness. It's not a route to happiness. Whereas the adults are much, they've got a much bigger story going on about what it all means, unfortunately. Sadly. Um, yeah. And it means, because the point is, is that we've, we've, we've come, I think as, as humans, and I'm not sure where it's come from, but we've come to, uh, I think, connect uh, happiness with obtaining things whether we obtain an object or we obtain um, another human being or we obtain an outcome that equates to happiness and so we're constantly looking to obtain that in order to but the point I think that I find interesting is the experience itself is often lost in that in that process and then as a result you kind of you, you devalue the experience both for yourself and for the individuals absolutely that's that's exactly the the, the misunderstanding that and it's not just sport it's 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 where we are as a as a society as a culture is is that our our happiness comes from from outside from objects from relationships from from the material world whereas when we you know as I say when we're playing when we're playing games as kids as i say it's an, that's an expression of happiness it's a it's an expression of fulfillment it's not a route to get somewhere to 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 get something in order to become happy um and and this comes as i say this misunderstanding is to my mind at the root of everything that that we're struggling with in terms of as as coaches and as players because we it it just doesn't work that way it's 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 never worked that way and one of the things I I talk to to coaches about is 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 what they trust more is it is it their belief or is it their their direct experience and the more we look in the direction of our, our direct experience, we can see that that you know we can be happy in a situation that maybe is not ideal, and we can be unhappy in a situation which other people would think was perfect. So, the there is no causal relationship between the external circumstances of our lives and how we feel. Yeah. Um, and that's that's an illusion that 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 is it's a powerful one, and we're, we're we're constantly caught up in it. And unfortunately, it it starts at a young age where we we point kids outside to the reasons why they might be feeling a certain way, rather than you know they 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 know life before they can before they can talk before they can communicate. Life is just a, an experience. So sometimes they're up sometimes they're down sometimes they're having a nice experience sometimes it's not a good experience but they've got nothing on that but as soon as as soon as they they can understand and they can communicate that they'll they'll maybe become upset and an adult will ask them what's wrong why are you feeling the way you're feeling so we're immediately pointing them to point of them outside to to why they might have been feeling the way they're feeling six weeks ago when they couldn't understand they were just having an experience and an experience that they would be over in a, in a short period of time but now all of a sudden there's a reason for why they're feeling the way they're feeling and you know so it goes on from there they we spend the rest of our lives pointing or the rest of their childhood pointing kids to you know if you do this you will be happy if you get this you will be happy you mustn't do this or this or you will be unhappy and that's just not true our experience doesn't come from outside we you know our, our, our feelings we, we live in this ebb and flow of thought and feeling and we experience that from moment to moment you can wake up one morning and feel happy and be okay with life you can wake up the next morning and be grumpy and a bit frustrated or peed off and there's no reason for it it's just how you feel but what we do is then we start looking out outside for reasons why we feel the way we feel and it's it's an illusion so so that's that's a, a really interesting point that i want to dwell on a little bit which is you know i i i, I came across that idea um 
uh, a few years ago and it's something that's been sort of sitting with me as a concept for quite some time but I find it very difficult to come to terms with a little bit um which is so uh, I think on a and I, this is where I struggle a little bit is it, on a conceptual level that makes sense to me as log- logically you know the logic of that makes sense but at the same time there is this thing there is this human experience <laughs> which kind of gets in the way um and so what I what I mean by that is if I can just expand a little bit so that I, we can sort of yep. this idea of uh, we point people to that we feel like this because right which yeah. is a which is a, a i guess a intuitive make it makes intuitive sense because and, and i think a lot of the time we are mate i don't think it does make intuitive sense this is where i think we've got it back to front i think intuitively we know what's true this is so what, what i've had a few conversations in the last couple of weeks i think one of them might have been with yourself where people have said my head really hurts after that conversation. <laughs> and, and I think what's going on there is people are trying to understand this intellectually where it, it's not an intellectual understanding. This is, this is what we might call common sense or gut instinct or intuition. Intuitively, we know that our feelings don't come from the outside world, but it's a learned intellectual understanding that we've been pointed to culturally and societally that it does come from outside so i think i know exactly what you're saying but i think it's the other way around i think i think you're right in the sense of uh, i think that intu- intuitively it feels that uh, i feel like this because it because because i that's what i've been taught to believe yeah everybody exactly. in the world yeah. has always told me that yeah fair everything enough everything yeah. you read tells you that go Absolutely. to any self-help book in a in the library it's yeah. always you feel like this because because exactly yeah. and yeah. so it's quite when you hear somebody say actually you don't you're not a victim of circumstance uh, yeah. and and constantly at the mercy of the things that happen to you as a means by which to whether you will feel joy or pain or whatever yeah. actually there's just experiences that that seem to be joyful or seem to be painful and depending on on the way you sit with those experiences i'm going to use some really clumsy language throughout this entire conversation how you sit with that experience actually determines um whether you even perceive those experiences of either of either being negative or positive the idea that there's actually value to joy on different set of value to to pain you know and we're trying to get away from what i'm trying to say is is that there is a and this idea that um those things come about because of what happens to us and there's a you're saying something different you're saying those things just come about right yeah and they happen to correlate with experiences but more often than not it's ourselves telling ourselves that i'm feeling like this because yeah. is part of our challenge what we should be saying is is that i'm just feeling something yeah it happens to it, ha- it feels a certain way i'm labeling it as something because of something that's around me but i've got a choice as to how i go around as to go labeling it and it's a bit clumsy but that's sort of what you're saying or am i am i going a bit too no, far you, no that's 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 on the right that's certainly on the right track so what we're what we're saying is we we going going back to the belief and experience thing so we we have an experience and it makes us feel a certain way and our conditioning then causes us to go off on a wild goose chase to find a reason why we're we're feeling the way we're feeling and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's been quite a lot of stuff talked about. Confirmation bias is, is, is the key to this. So, you, you know, we can, we can see a situation and jump on that. And then the reason becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of that looks like a plausible explanation. So I'm going to go with that. And then that becomes part of our belief system. Whereas our experience is actually telling us something, something different, just to use, a, 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 again, a clumsy example. I'm sat in a traffic jam one, way, one day and I'm feeling frustrated and annoyed and grumpy. And it looks like the traffic is causing me to feel the way that I'm feeling. 
a couple of weeks later, I'm sat in a traffic jam and I'm listening to the radio and I'm chilling out and I'm getting lost in my own thinking and I'm actually having a reason, you know, it's not, it's not bothering me at all. I'm just stuck in a traffic jam. So my belief is that traffic can cause me to feel frustrated, annoyed, whatever, angry. My experience tells me that there's something else going on because if there was a causal relationship between the traffic and my feelings, every time I was in that traffic or in that situation, I would feel the same way about it. And as I say, if you like the, the only thing that I'm pointing to and and that I try to ask people to do is just when they feel a particular way is just ask them to test out what they're feeling is 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 that is your feeling a belief or is it is it an you know is your experience or is 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 the reason you're making up for why you're feeling the way you're feeling a belief or is your direct experience telling you something different and when we start to look at this we realize that a lot of the beliefs we had about why we feel the way we feel about all sorts of things are made up I I can hear um, people asking the question because I kind of want to ask it, which is the question question I've got is, which is, are you therefore saying that um, experiences don't create feelings? No. Go on then. There's a subtle difference here. The, The, what... The experience again. We, I didn't. When when we came on today, I was going to kind of ask the question whether you wanted to go, and we've kind of gone in that in a particular direction. Whether we want to start with some implications and then try and back into the principles which underpin it all, or do we want to start with the principles behind it all and then explore some implications? But let's kind of keep going on the way we're going. If so, you want to rewind, by all means, do. It's fine. No, no, we're good. We're good as we are. So just just in that example there. So. The, our experience is, is real and we will feel whatever we feel based on that experience. But what I'm suggesting is that what we think we're experiencing is not real. What we so, think we're experiencing isn't real. N- no, because so what we feel is real. Yeah. What I we fe- think, I, I, yeah. Go on. Yeah. I feel, I feel we feel what we feel. So if you're, if you know, you, you could, you could have a scary dream and you know, you believe that you're being chased through the house by a man with a, yeah. a big ax or something. That experience of being chased is absolutely real. But the, the thing that you think you're experiencing is not, is not real at all. So our feelings come from our perceptions, our thinking, our, our mind, if you want to call it that what we actually believe we are experiencing there is much less of a reality to that than we are led to believe okay so you're saying so i really like this quote by the way but what we feel is real but what we think we're experiencing isn't as real as we think yeah yeah that's that, again talking about that's pretty clumsy i would you know i'd never write it down like that but we can go with it so so it, it's you know reality or truth is whatever it is regardless of 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 what we think about it and it it you know it doesn't change depending on who's looking at it or who's experiencing it it is what it it is what it is you know tiger woods it is what it is yeah. but we, we you know are we gonna are we gonna believe are we gonna go with our beliefs in terms of what we make of that experience or are we actually going to go with you know when i I'm, I'm, again i'm getting com- not confused but i'm getting clumsy in my language in terms of an experience and experience as in what we are what's happening around us or what we're what's going on with us at that particular moment so you, you know and most of the time we go with our beliefs, even though our experience is telling us something completely different. I mean, as a coach, I'm sure you've had your beliefs changed a number of times over the last (laughs) 
however many years and that and that's my experience daily at the moment <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe everything i don't believe now what i believe to be true 10 years ago 100 yeah so so how can belief be a good way of determining what what reality is what truth is it it, it just doesn't make any sense and so when I say we've got a choice, so either we either we go with belief or we go with our direct experience, that then leads us on to say, well, if we're going to go with experience, which I think is the only option other than belief, you, you know, unless you can come up with a different option, um, it's either belief or experience. It's one of the two. Okay. And if 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 we're going to go with experience as coaches and as, 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 as teachers and as, as, as guides, as counselors, whatever you, whatever word you want to use, it seems to me that it's absolutely essential that we have a deep understanding of the nature of our experience of how that experience comes to be. And, and that's where I think we're, we're missing so much in terms of of coach education and in terms of of how we how we help other people see the nature of their experience how can you un if you i use this expression a lot if you don't understand you can't understand the view through the window if you don't understand the nature of the window you're looking through Mm. and if we don't understand the nature of our own mind our minds are how we create our perceptions our feelings our sensations if we don't understand the limitations of our own mind if we don't understand the nature of our own mind how do we know that what we're experiencing and what we're pointing people to is 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 true or not Mm. so it, it seems to me that the first thing any of us should do is is learn about the nature of our experience how our experience is created and that's the, the basis of what what I'm suggesting we should be doing and it's kind of why you know I ask questions on Twitter and point stuff out to people on Twitter because it's whenever I see somebody come up with with something that that is based on belief rather than direct experience it, it kind of seems to me well if we don't call that out if we don't question that then we're just perpetuating this misunderstanding all the time um, so how do um on that question then you just said that um understanding the nature of our experience yeah how how do we go about doing that and and why do we get it wrong why do we get tripped up because obviously you know the vast majority of human beings are living under this misapprehension or fallacy that um that, you know that that things that happen in their experience they they i mean i like the window analogy i think i, I use that I, I, that aligns to me a lot which is you know the idea of you know if you're looking at something through through a certain window or a certain lens i suppose yeah it appears to you as this but yeah. if you look at it in through a different lens it appears to you as something else absolutely so, you know and a really simple example of that i suppose is you know that a lot of people are and i used to be you know terrified of spiders right because they're looking at it thinking that's the world's most dangerous, horrible little <laughs> thing that could, that could crawl up my leg or bite me or kill me or whatever it is. And then you're looking at it through another lens and you go, that's the world's, that's an, an that's a tiny little thing that is scared to death of me because I'm a giant and he's desperate to get away from me. And then you, that, your lens changes, doesn't it? And you sort of Absolutely. think, well, there's, there's no reason to feel fearful of that. Absolutely. Or, or certainly as fearful as that. Absolutely. And, so that's just two different lenses, isn't it? It is. And, 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 you know, I, I'm talk. I, I think we're, we're, we're absolutely on the right track in terms of point, but I'm saying that actually the, the mind itself is a form of lens. So basically our mind, our, our mind will project its own limitations onto all the subsequent knowledge that it has. So, it's like this is why you can't understand this on an intellectual level it's 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 a felt experience if you want to put it like that because the intellect is downstream of of wisdom of of intuition of of 
understanding if you want to put it like that so the the intellect it's almost like a filing system it's you know it's only as good as what goes into it in terms of what comes out of it whereas when we start to look in when we start to understand the limitation of our own mind we we realize that actually there is no limit to the insights we can have to the creative solutions we can come up with we're not limited by our intellect even though if our mind believes that that's what we are then that, then that's how it will be we're back to the confirmation bias thing again you're asking me to do something extremely dangerous there which is <laughs> to let go of my intellect or my rational brain because that's what keeps me safe in the world that's what stops me from walking off cliffs you know i, I my I, I my don't. My intuition might might sense say that I'm I'm a aerobatic animal that could fly. My rational brain tells me not to jump off the cliff because I'm actually more like a stone. Mate, so I, I'm, I'm how going, do you overcome that? That how do you overcome that limitation? I'm I'm going with the other way round. I'm saying it's your intuition that knows that you can't fly. It would be a delusion. It would be an in, it would be something. It would you you would need to convince yourself intellectually that you could fly to allow yourself to throw yourself <laughs> off a building. <laughs> Have a damn good go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, as I say, okay. so that's okay. the, that, that's. So we need to listen to our intuition. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we are, we are infinitely more capable than we, our intellect sometimes give us credit for is kind of what I'm saying. So, you know where where does insight come from where does thought come from where does creativity come from it's not from the intellect the intellect is like as i say it's like a computer it's 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 only you only get out what you put what you put into it it's it's what's underneath that that's really powering this system powering this you know we've you only need to look at what human beings have achieved over the last 200 years to realize that there's you know the 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 knowledge if all if the only knowledge we had is what was already out there then we just keep you know we, we, there'd be no room for insight there'd be no room for creativity that that's that's where the power is it's not in the intellect it's in what comes before the intellect how can you suddenly not understand something and then understand it three seconds later it's it's insight that drives that not that not the intellect and um it's interesting i've um i'm trying to remember the book i read recently um about that like where insights come from and that's um often why you have um revelations um you know or, or powerful ideas or moments of creativity or insight come to you like when you're you know, kind of semi in a semi distracted state. So the, the, the inter, so like the shower is the favorite one, isn't it? Exactly. Or you know, going for a walk or taking the dog for a walk or driving, you know, how often have we been at work or, mm-hmm. and we've been trying to solve a particular problem. We've been churning it over in our mind. We've been discussing it with other people, we've been cogitating over it and we're stuck. And then we walk out the door, we get in the car, we go home and you're sat in your chair that evening. You say you're in the shower, you're cutting the lawn and all of a sudden, bang, yeah, there it or you, is. The or you're in a meeting solution. and you're trying to think of somebody's name, and you can't for the life of you think of somebody's name, and then in the car on the yeah. way home it hits you. Yeah, exactly. Dang. So that that's you know that's why again this this idea just this is I'm going off on a little aside, but I think it's 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 a good thing to to kind of cover at this point is this idea that we control what we think about. We control, you, you know, human beings don't control what they think about and when they think it. You know, anybody that's forgotten somebody's name is the example you just gave there or left their keys somewhere or taken the wrong turning off a motorway. The, the, the belief that human beings control what we think and when we think it is a belief. That's not, how, that's not our experience. Our experience is that we forget stuff, but we also have amazing ideas, which we don't know where they came from. Yeah. So this idea that that we should try we should be always trying to control thought monitor thought reframe thought that's just not how we work and 
you know, the, the, again, it looks like it would be lovely if we could do that. But if we could control thought, we'd be limited to, as I say, the, just the knowledge that we, that we could get from the world of form. We'd never have an insight. So the, the um, yeah, I mean, this is worth just dwelling on a little bit as well, because that's, that's another area, an idea that doesn't necessarily um, come Nat- naturally to people in the sense that that we're not a thinker of thoughts the idea is you know we are basically inside our heads thinking thoughts as you know we're basically inside a a, 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 a meat crea- <laughs> a, a vehicle made of meat <laughs> we're yeah. a meat computer as yeah. some people would say it. yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, and we're thinking thoughts continuously and we are yeah. the thinker of our thoughts yeah is in reality is is that that um thoughts just arise they and and we've all had that experience haven't we where you're sitting there just sort of kind of minding your own business and a thought pops into your head and you know you haven't you haven't thought of it you haven't you haven't like willfully exactly. created that thought it's just arise and sometimes some of those thoughts are like oh god what the hell have i thought of that where's that come thought. from yeah. exactly yeah yeah exactly we're that's not a thinker of thoughts thought arises thought arises yeah that's a great way of putting it and and so we are capable of thinking though but that's different isn't it i i i try not to get into that because it just it it just really muddies the water i know exactly what you're saying and it's probably a a, a, a great discussion mm. over a couple of pints in a pub one evening um i'm not sure going down that route here is gonna enlighten people mm-hmm. um but yeah it's and 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 from that flows this misunderstanding and i think you and i had a little exchange on on twitter about it the other day which is this idea that that we have choice and we make decisions because if we don't control thought we don't we don't make choices and we don't make decisions we don't there is at the level of the intellect there is we, there is no such thing as free will and that's a hard thing for people to Mm-hmm. To, to kind of get their heads around as well but again i just i just point back to our experience in the conversation we've just had which is that if we don't control thought which we've kind of agreed that we don't because of the way thought comes and goes and is is well i'm prepared to cons- i'm prepared to i'm not going to necessarily say that i agree with you we agree agree with this what i'm saying is is that i i i can understand that there there's a there's a body of um uh, I don't know. There's a body of work. There are an awful. There is quite a lot of people out there. I mean, one of the per, the first people who um, got me into this sort of kind of realm of thinking is Sam Harris, um, yeah. and he's got his book Free Will. Yeah. And you know, he basically posits a hypothesis. Not not everybody agrees with him, um, including many of his like you know closest friends. That that you know his his posits hypothesis that there is no such thing as free will. And the reason he says that is because because we're not thinkers of thought we're not in control of thought even neurologically because his background is in neuroscience he's saying neurologically you know we are not we don't have free will because we're not in control of our thoughts and actually there are you know both um, i think chemical and you know neuro- neurobiological processes in place that we aren't necessarily in control of and and obviously that then takes you into the realm of well could we then have responsibility and all these sorts of things that's that, i'm not going to go there but there is this idea now I don't quite yet know what I think about that, but what I'm prepared to, to accept is that I'm open to that as an idea. I, I think I know I've, I've read, you know, I've listened to Sam Harris's podcast and stuff and, and there's some really interesting stuff in there. To me, it's, 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 it's actually, it, I know exactly what he's saying, but to me it works on a slightly different, it, it works slightly differently. Okay. The, the fundamental misunderstanding is that who is it who is making the decisions and creating the thoughts? So this, this, is, what, this is, if you like, the nitty-gritty. This is where I probably was, as I say, was hoping maybe to start. But if it's where we end up, then that's great. So, so what we're asking here is, is if, if we're going to go into, so what is the nature of the human experience? The next question is, well, who are we? What, what is it that is, is what is it that, that 
is is having this experience of being a human mm-hmm. and in order to answer you know to come to the question of well who is who is the thinker of thoughts who is making decisions who is making choices who has free will we can't just you know we're assuming and and this is a belief that this body this mind is is a thing it exists now again this is if we start to go down a route of of questioning our experience in a logical way i don't think we get to a point where we can say with any confidence that a human being the essence of a human being is a body and a mind Mm -hmm. that 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 doesn't make sense to me what what happens when you continue down that line of questioning is what you get to the essence of of experience the essence of a human being is the awareness of our experience yeah so you know we can we can the experience that we have as a human being is changing all the time from moment to moment, second to second, day to day, hour to hour, our experience is always changing. But the awareness by which that experience is known is constant. It's permanent. It's infinite. It never changes. It never stops. And that's the opposite way round to how, society and culturally we we see the world most people believe that our experience is the thing that's permanent and our awareness of that changes and comes and goes but if you if you drill down into the into the nature of experience and question it deeply it has to be the other way around so you you can kind of you can test this out for yourself so if you shut your eyes for, for for a second your experience has completely changed Mm. agreed mm-hmm. one minute it was light and you were seeing the room next minute it's dark mm-hmm. so your experience has changed but the awareness by which that experience is known is exactly the same that hasn't changed yeah and that is that that's a really simple example of what is going on all the time permanently we are the human experience is that awareness and we are having an experience within that awareness, which is, which, which is changing all the time. And it's, you know, we can have it as a, you know, and then, so, so that's, that's what's going on. We're having this experience. We are the awareness of that experience. And then as part of our thinking, which is, is part of that experience, we're making a judgment on whether we like that experience or whether we don't like it, whether we think we should change it. So this is, this is where we, we get confused. The entity which we believe is making decisions and is having the experience is actually part of the experience we are the, the 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 human experience who we really are the true self if you want to call it like that is awareness itself it's the knowing of our experience it's not part of that experience the body is part of our experience our mind is part of our experience our true self who we really are is the awareness of both of those things uh, and are you using awareness in the same sense as someone might use the word consciousness absolutely yeah the two words are in 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 my in in my mind the two words are interchangeable so the nature of consciousness the nature of awareness consciousness or awareness is the medium by which all experience is known i'm you you can tell now. I'm, <laughs> I'm you really... won't see this on the podcast, but Stu is looking um, <laughs> bemused. Um, it's probably slightly stronger than bemused, slightly slightly. Um, yeah, befuddled, incongruous. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm. There's a part of me that's just just kind of wants to go. 
huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know I if know. I get it. <laughs> but that's it. That's again, that's the head hurting moment. I was going to, I did a, I did a, a podcast with Russ Earnshaw the other day and he was like, Oh, my head hurts after that. So it's all right. We'll do another one. We'll call it the Panadol edition um, <laughs> where we'll, we'll, we'll kind of try and try and so yeah, again, the intellect, the intellect doesn't get this because the intellect is downstream of awareness. So you can't be, a, you, 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 you can't have an intellect without something that's aware of, of what the intellect is creating. But so let's 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 use the word consciousness because it might help me. Yeah. Um, okay. So th- there's this thing called consciousness, um, and um, what you're saying is is that um, consciousness is constant. Yeah. But our experiences change. Yeah. Um, and this was something that you said to me on Twitter when we were having that kind of back and forth on that, because that's the bit that I just don't get. Okay. Have you ever had an experience outside of awareness, outside of consciousness? Well, no one has. There you go. Well, no, what I'm saying is, but what I mean by that is, is that if you say, if we talk about consciousness, as in the lights are on, if the lights aren't on, you haven't had an experience. Exactly. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the nub of it. Okay. So consciousness is the primary fundamental element of experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we are conscious. Uh, again, Not conscious I would, in the that, sense of awake, but conscious in the sense of that. That's again, I, I go, we, no, we are in consciousness. We are not human beings. Don't have consciousness. We are in consciousness. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so if, if you want to, use use the analogy of a room so consciousness is the space in the room everything that happens within that room happens within consciousness and if a fight breaks out in that room is a is consciousness or awareness bothered by the fight that's breaking out in the room well no it's just an experience it, it, it doesn't get changed by the fight in the room. The fight stops and it just carries so, on as it was. Okay, before. yeah. So, so consciousness doesn't doesn't get doesn't change. Exactly. No. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, but my experience in that room has changed dramatically. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so this is, and again, you know, you said to me the other day, you, you asked a brilliant question, which was basically, so what? <laughs> it's the so what question. But so why yeah. why is this important? Okay, yeah. this is what it. it. Yeah. Okay. So this is, and this is, this is key. So if this, if what I'm pointing to is true, and as I say, I'm not, I'm not asking anybody to take on this as a belief, just use your own experience to question how you're seeing it. If who we really are, the true self is consciousness is awareness You cannot, that cannot be damaged by any experience that you can have. So who you really are, your true self, your well-being cannot be damaged or harmed by losing a rugby match, getting shouted at by a parent, losing your job, a relationship going bad, having no money, and it can't be enhanced by winning a rugby match getting a load of praise, winning a Nobel Peace Prize, having a brilliant relationship. It's, it's just, it just is. But the, 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 the thing that we forget is when we are just being, which is, you know, the state of meditation or peace, happiness, love, whatever you want to call it. That's our true nature. If awareness is who we really are, then our true nature is simply the knowing of that. And that is the feeling which we all experience as, as peace, as happiness, as love, as, as, as fulfillment, as contentment. 
that's what we're all going back to the seeking and resisting. That's what we're all seeking. Um, we are all resisting things which stop us feeling that. Okay. So if I'm, let me put this into my terms and completely butcher the idea probably, but um, I, it feels to me like what you're saying is we as human beings are in this stream that, that you're referring to as consciousness, right? Where we, we basically just exist and we think uh, our rational or intellect thinks that we're able to be knocked out of that stream by experience and we allow um, ourselves, we, we allow ourselves to think that we're knocked out of that stream you know, and that stream is just that, like you say, it's it's contentment, it's peace, it's it's just the sense of I'm just here in 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 my body, it's <laughs> floating beautiful. through space and time. Absolutely, it's just a sense of a sense being. of being. Yeah, it's a yeah. sense of being. Okay. And we we rarely because because we're constantly bombarded and floated around in this in this thing called experience, where we have to interact with the human beings. We rarely feel that that moment of peace Beautiful. or contentment or whatever Beautiful. it is so so and, and so we because we and then we we are led to believe that because the because um we're always told like you say as children that why are you feeling like that? you're feeling that because you're feeling like that because we always then therefore think that um the the state of being that um you're talking about which is that brings about the peace and the contentment is something that gets that is 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 knockaboutable <laughs> but it isn't and it's, at and it's attainable and it needs to be attained it comes from outside it comes from achievements relationships doing stuff getting stuff so you just have to almost so so actually the the this uh, enabling individuals to to find not find wrong word uh, to experience or to to be in that moment of of um yeah. consciousness i suppose I, I guess some people would would some people re refer to that as flow yeah flow yeah. um so you're in the meditation you, th th this is so so it's like when you're, you're, you're almost lost yeah you're connected from re reality to a t to a certain extent you haven't you're, you're in the but, present moment you're in the now yeah, yeah. and when yeah. we're in the now the the sense of separation, so the ego, if you want to call it that. So the, so the ego is who we think we are. That's the sense of us as an individual entity detached from consciousness, detached from awareness, which is, is that's, how we, that's how we live, that we live, we live as a separate entity going about our daily business. Mm -hmm. And it's a, all that is is a refraction of consciousness. Mm. And... We, we go off and we, we believe that, that that separate entity, that, that, that separate self needs to do stuff, have stuff, create stuff, be, you know, be something. And, and we just lose sight of the, of the fact that we are already what we are trying to become. <laughs> it, you, you know, it's like the little old lady wandering around looking for her glasses when they're perched on top of her head. Mm -hmm. it, it's, we, we, you know, we spend pretty much all of our lives searching for something we've already got and trying to become something which we already are. Mm. And, and that's, you know, that's the great illusion as, as somebody once said. But so, and this is where the, so what question comes back, which is, um, the, the thing I always kind of get is, is right. So I, I can, I can sit with uh, <clears throat> that, that sort of uh, sen sense of the human experience. Yeah. I can, I can sit with that and, I, and I've experienced it in the sense that, or I've been conscious of it. I don't know what the, what the right words are, but in the sense of, you know, I've had, I have moment, I've had moments of flow. I've had moments of that sense of contentment and peace and 
I think a lot of people try to seek it, and the seeking is part of the problem. Don't seek it. Mate, just... the, seeking, the seeking is the problem. That's yeah. exactly it. The, the yeah. moment we start seeking or resisting, so the moment we, we, we forget who we really are, we forget we are consciousness, we forget we are awareness, we're, we're immediately into seeking something or resisting something. But you can't just be. No, because we live in the illusion. Yeah, if you've been so, living in the illusion and and you're conditioned, yeah. you know, we're, we're navigating our way through the world. Yeah. We've got this big brain that's telling us, you know, this all this sort of stuff that's, conf- yeah. that's giving us constantly giving us this illusion yeah. that experience is affecting us. So it's yeah. very hard to kind of just go, yeah, 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 well, forget that, just be. Ab- and that's absolutely. what you that's what I that was the big part of our debate uh, on Twitter. Yeah, was you know I'd I'd retweeted this position around elite athletes and there was an issue around elite athletes and how many of them are you know suffering from you know depression and all that sort of stuff because they haven't achieved what they set out to achieve. You get a silver medal and I'm depressed for the rest of my life because I didn't get the gold. And yeah. I was saying uh, my argument was or the point I'd made was that you know actually the fact that they think like that they think differently that that ob- the ob- obtaining of the thing will bring them a sense of um, su- success and which they equate to happiness because that's how they're wired, right? Yeah. Is, is the thing that drives them to, to the, you know, to do the crazy stuff that most people wouldn't, wouldn't want to or conceive of doing. But it also the thing that I said, I, my point was it makes them fragile and means that they can easily break. And you said you took, you took, um, um, you said that was a load of old tosh, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's been slightly unkind, mate. But no, I, 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 dis- I, I, I didn't disagree with what you were saying because what you were what you were pointing out. Well, I mean that that I don't know if you read that study, but it was it was the the, the worst example of kind of clickbaity headline correlation as cause nonsense. It was a clumsy retweet, but it, yeah, go on. It, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, um, what what I was saying was that, without a doubt, the, the experience of an elite athlete is different from what most other human beings, the experience of most other human beings. Yeah. So they will have different habits of thought. They will have different habits of behavior. But what, what I was getting at was that's that's and under it all we are all the same we are all consciousness refracting and having the experience of a human being and that experience could be anything yeah but this is this is where i you know the the conversation we had about all human beings being created equal this is what i'm pointing to we are all the we are all we are one consciousness having 7 billion experiences of being a human being mm most people think it's the other way around. They think it's 7 billion separate consciousnesses having an experience of one world. That's not how, when, when you break it down, that's not how it is. So though those elite, um, kind of lost my train of thought. What was the question again? (laughs) Those elite athletes, the way they, my argument was because of the way they think. Yeah. Um, they their experience is such that yeah. they um uh you know they have an experience which makes them in my opinion very susceptible to this kind of uh you know this kind of like life experience i suppose i, I think i think that there, there might be some but i i, I just think that that's a, a game it's so hard to generalize it's so because you you will get you know the example I like to point to is Roger Federer, who is possibly the best tennis player that we've ever known, who, if you read a lot of what he says and a lot of what he what is written about him, he he has a sense of what we're pointing to. Um, and you'd never describe him as being fragile. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, where, where we, where we, where we, where I'm coming from is, I'm not, I'm not saying 
you know, you, you said, so this is the, I've found it now. So you said, Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, I, well, I said, right. So let me, let me go through the timeline. Cause it's probably useful. Cause it's yeah. actually, it's actually a useful uh, illustration. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Elite athletes don't think like normal people. This is me. Uh, that's what makes them elite. It's also what makes them incredibly fragile. One of the reasons that I believe so passionately in helping young people to develop the psychological, emotional tools to navigate through the journey. What I mean by, by the way, when I say psychological, emotional tools, what I mean is actually we need to kind of help them to reframe that or to, to, ref, to, to use different lenses or to reframe what they think of as experience in a different way. I'd, um, I'd, I'd change that slightly. What we need to do is help them understand what lens it is that they are looking through. Already. Okay. Already. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, all, that's all we need to do. So Which we don't mean given to them by others teaching them that they have a certain they should think about this in a certain way yeah yeah basically so so the lens the lens if you understand the lens that you are looking through life through you will have a much better idea of reality than if you than if you don't and just giving kids or athletes or anybody else different lenses isn't necessarily going to help them understand the nature of that lens because it's just another variation of a lens. So, so your, your response to me was, yeah, mate, this isn't true. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Right. Hang on. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) He said they are human beings who are good at sport. The experience of a dustman dinner lady or deep sea diver is created in the same way as an Olympic athlete. Dividing the human race into types and categories is where we're going wrong. There is no separation. Right. Beautiful. Okay. So that's, I, no, I absolutely stand by that. So, and an elite athlete has their experience through consciousness. They, they are the same consciousness that we all are. Their experience within consciousness, yes, will be very different, but they are no different at their source, at their, at, at what makes them human at the, at the source of what makes them human than anybody else. Mm. That's what I was pointing to. So, which they're, is they're... which is true, but I, I my point was, and, and Rich Hudson, who is also a friend of ours, um, you know, said the same sort of thing. And I, and I, my argument was, and I said, you know, I said it's not. I wasn't saying they're different people. I wasn't saying that they're separate from everybody else. I'm just saying they think differently. Yeah, and mate, look, this is again. I can't. I can't. I'm not going to disagree with that because they do. They do think differently. But what I then pointed to was the fact that every single athlete within every single elite athlete will think differently from other elite athletes. There won't be a consistent way of thinking among a particular group of elite athletes. So, so what I was trying to say was there will be. There will be very. There won't be. There won't the. the the people who have silver medals within that group, their experience won't be the same individually. Mm -hmm. No, agreed. And, and their experience will be different from those people who got gold medals and their experience will be different from those people who got bronze medals. I think the point I was trying to make though, is um, the conditioning um, and actually, um, and I think this is a very, very important, thing to talk about in the current climate where we're talking about duty of care yeah and there's a big thing about you know athletes being bullied athletes being you know uh yeah. you know forced to do things against their will and all these sorts of things and you know duty of care and culture and everything else and and the solutions that are often proposed here is you know we we have to um have a we have to you know kind of change the culture and we have to change actually i'm not sure we do i think one of the things we should do is just and, I, and this has been a, thesis, a central thesis of mine for some time, not necessarily talking in the language that you're talking about. But I think one of the one of the things we do have to do is 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 to make a difference to the environment. The environment's important. And it, I think it, and the experiences that people have, again, you know, it's it's very easy to just say, well, actually, if you just understand the nature of experience, the nature of consciousness, then actually you can just navigate through this and everything's hunky dory. It just doesn't work like that because um you know, you're having to kind of deprogram yourself from, you know, having to be part of this world, this experience. And sometimes, you know, you get derailed and, and now the next thing you, you know, you've, you've lost, you lost. Now I believe that if you've got, if, if you've, 
if you've been helped to understand the nature of your experience mm. in a diff in a different way than you would have perhaps traditionally been taught i think that's in that that gives you a real sense uh, not real uh, that gives some strength that that means that you can um interpret experiences differently so my my thesis was if you push or drive athletes and and sell them the narrative uh, that it's about work effort dedication commitment and if you don't have those things you're not going to make it if you won't go the extra mile and actually the only thing that's important to you is making it or getting the gold or all these sorts of things and anything less than that is seen as failure right if that's the narrative right and it's a compelling one right mm. you can understand can't you why uh, individuals who have kind of been locked into that that sort of you know kind of vortex if they don't achieve what it is that they think they should have achieved in order to in order to obtain this thing called peace nirvana, nirvana happiness whatever we're going to yeah. call it you can understand can't you how that can affect them unless they have a different understanding of the human experience that right that's so so there's two things going on there one what what's driving that culture of hard work and sacrifice and striving and punishing yourself and you know win at all costs the pervasive narrative the pervasive narrative what's driving that the misunderstanding that that's where happiness comes from yeah but it's everywhere uh, but yeah that but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't call it out <laughs> no i know that but what i'm saying yes yes well we could we could call it out or we could help the athlete to be able to uh kind of cut through that why don't we do both because it's well point... because it's much harder to sort the other stuff out trust me i've tried mate, I, <laughs> i'm not going to have an argument with you about that mate <laughs> you, you know this because you yeah, absolutely mate yeah look you've been swimming upstream all your life probably <laughs> absolutely so so as i say but what i'm what i'm saying is is if we stick rigorously to helping athletes coaches administrators politicians if we stick rigorously to no matter who we're talking to pointing to the true nature of our experience then we are delivering a consistent message and the outcome will be the same which is people see through the illusion that their well-being and their happiness comes from outside from achievement from winning from whatever wherever they think it comes from so y yes by all means let's start with let's start with the athletes because you know some 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 the fact that some athletes thrive in that in that environment and some don't points to the fact that it's not the environment that's causing the people to break down that 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 break down no it's their uh perception of what's happening it, in the environment it's it's their it's their yeah yeah it's it's the fact that they believe that their well-being is being damaged or harmed by what they see as the environment about now you, you and i both know that the environment or the culture is is 100 percent a perception it's an experience within awareness it's not real it's what we've it's what we think it is yeah. So this is this was my point where we had a, a conversation about, you know, we're spending coaches and 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 sporting bodies are spending hours and hours and millions of pounds trying to create environments and cultures which they think are going to aid performance. When all of those environment and culture is a perception. It's a thought, a feeling, a perception, a sensation within awareness. So you can have a, you can have a squad of players within a particular club. They're all in the same environment. They're all in the same culture. Some of them will be happy and performing well, and some of them will be unhappy and performing badly. So therefore, there is zero causal relationship between their environment and their culture and what's going on inside them. And again, this is the misunderstanding. What if if we spent a third, if we spent a, a, a tenth of that money and time and effort explaining to people what the true nature of that experience was and why 
one day in, in going, they go into training and they feel great and the next day they go into training and they don't feel great, that's got to be a more efficient way of, of, of helping people than constantly trying to fix an environment and fix a culture, which are perceptions anyway. Well, yes, yes, but I think it's both, isn't it? Because it's not like you can, um, you know, sp- I don't know why, but I'm thinking about the matrix, right? I'm thinking about being part of the mainframe, right? So it's not like you can be disconnected from everybody else all the time, right? You know, no, you can... no, you're, you're actually connected. You're actually connected to everybody else on the whole planet a hundred percent of the time. No, but what I, what well, I mean is, what I mean is, so if we go back to my point around this kind of state of flow or this state yeah. of consciousness where we're, yeah we're at peace and we're being right. Yeah. Even those, even the most enlightened yogis in the world who have, you know, spent, you know, hours and hours and hours in contemplation and sitting there and, and sitting there being and, 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 uh, you know, and are a kind of peace with themselves. Right. There are times in which the environment affects even them. Absolutely. And so most but, of us are not able to be in that state all the time. So therefore none we, of us we would, we would ideally like, wouldn't we, for, for there to be harmony where possible, would we not? I, I, I guess so. But I, I, again, I don't. When you see how when you see this clearly. You don't you don't that you know that whether there's harmony or not, it's not going to affect it doesn't affect you. It's not affecting who you really are. So, you know, two of my best friends you know, in this understanding of both professional rugby players, they're not wandering around the field just being. They're hitting people hard, they're smashing rucks, they're carrying the ball, they're training like, you know, the elite athletes that they are. But, you know, they're, li- they're living their lives. And that's, that's again, the, if you like, there's, there's the seeing this, and get into a point where you see it clearly and then you've kind of got a choice you can either go and sit on a mat in a monastery somewhere and just be for the rest of your life or you can take this understanding and then get back into the muck and the bullets and live your life and and crack on and do whatever it is that Mm -hmm. makes sense to you in the moment and that's what most people do when they see this understanding because if you don't do that then you're not you're not you're not living your life yeah, but uh, what, what I'm trying to say is um, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that at all, right? And I'm saying that I think, I think some of the world's most successful athletes have had, the, whether it's a learned thing or they've just had this intuitive uh, yeah, understanding and, a, yeah. and a, a sense of peace. Yeah. And, and, they, and they can somehow connect with that. Or, or stay connected to that, not get disconnected like yeah, most of us. In, lovely, beautiful way of putting it. Um, stay connected to that. And, and that also tends to correlate with them performing in whatever domain they're performing in at their peak. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. Again, it's not... Again, I'd never say that that was a causal thing because no, 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 you, can, no. you can you can you can feel great and have an off day, and you that's can why feel I said it. Terrible. That's why I said it. Yeah. it carefully, it correlates. Said it, it correlates. It correlates. Yeah. yeah, perfect. It tends yeah. to correlate yeah. with. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's Not the other important that. point, isn't it? Is that um, people sort of think that if you can be in this optimal state, then you will perform at your best. Those two things are causal. They're not. They're not. Absolutely not. You can be in an optimal state and still perform dreadfully. Absolutely. And you can feel like a bag of you know what and, <laughs> and play out and your have skin. the best have the best game of your life. But how much how much again, how often do coaches tell players that to be in the right frame of mind, to have the right attitude, to be motivated and all the rest of it? One, nobody's in control of that. And two, it's that's got no bearing on performance anyway so my, my point though is that what i'm trying to say is i'm not disagreeing with that that idea because elite athletes like i said some of the world's best have have this in, have an intuitive sense of this but not everybody does right and so what i was going to say there is that um that what you would ideally i mean i'm an ecologist yeah so i believe in uh, uh creating environments that are aligned as much as possible mm. to 
uh, you know, a human being's, uh, I'm, I'm going to say aspiration, right? Aspiration's a bad thing here in this context, I know. It's but. not, mate. No, again, there's no good or bad. And look, you know, we, we all, as I say, at some point in our lives, every single human being has had the experience of peace and freedom and love and happiness. That's why we're drawn to it. That's why we go off seeking that, that state again. The illusion is that it's going to come from somewhere outside. It's already and there. It's already there, exactly. And so, actually, the seeking... The coming from outside is the bit that gets us in the way it, of being there. That gets in the way of it, exactly. exactly. But that doesn't, moment, have, that doesn't have to stop us, does it? No. From achieving. Do, do whatever you like. That, yeah. That's the thing. Somebody, I, I, somebody said to me the other day, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really low because I haven't got a purpose in life. And I'm like, mate, that's the best thing. You know, if you've got no purpose, that's, that's joy, that's liberation. Go away and do whatever makes you happy. <laughs> you know, Per, you know again this this idea of you have to find your why in order to be successful and in order to succeed is is that's just a belief you know just just when when you realize that at, it, if if what we're pointing to is true and there is just consciousness that means you know this is the the if anybody wants to go off and do any reading around this if you if you you know do a google search for non duality this is what we pointed to non duality there is there is only one non-duality, not two. We're pointing to oneness. So if, if we are pointing to oneness, there is no why, because there is no cause and effect. There is no mind and matter. What we're saying is there is consciousness and everything else is a refraction of that. And when you read any spiritual, any stuff, you know, if you read, if you're a spiritual person, person or you're religious or you're you're into philosophy all of the mainstream religions spiritual traditions and philosophies are all pointing to this idea they're all pointing to this as 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 the truth and what we're saying here is is understanding that that's how life works just means you can go off and do whatever you like and be free be happy be joyful but at the same time work your ass off strive be frustrated get angry get peed off when it doesn't go your way it's all good we're not denying any part of experience it's just experience but it's knowing that what is who you really are what's underpinning that is always okay no matter what so you, you know if if you're anxious it's not because there's something in the future that could affect your well-being. You can just go off and, and, and play the game, go off and coach the game. If you're feeling angry, it's not because somebody's done something to you. It's just because you've got caught up in the idea that you're something other than, than pure consciousness and that that can be affected by what that other person has done or said to you. But that, that but you, are you therefore saying then that, you know, anxiety. Yeah. So if somebody is, you know, has a, is, is anxious because let's say sake of argument, um, they've had a death threat. Mm. So they have a, there's, there's height of anxiety. Mm. Are you saying therefore that they shouldn't feel anxiety or are you saying that they should just accept the state that is anxiety. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying they should do or do or not do anything. Do anything. Well, it, well, what it's, then? It's it's understand where that 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 anxiety is not coming from the words that that person has spoken. So, so a death threat is coming from. It, it's coming from your thinking about what may or may not happen. It's not you, you know. That for that threat to mean something, you have to believe that you who you really are could be damaged by what that person could do to you. So let let I mean, because what I'm saying is, is like you know, there was a moment right where I wasn't anxious. Yeah. And then somebody sends me a tweet saying I'm from the um, 
agility ladder association of the world and i'm going to hang you with an agility ladder because of your stance on agility ladders mm. um which is perfectly perfectly <laughs> by the way this is perfectly perfectly feasible they're a nasty bunch they are you've got to be <laughs> careful of people like that um and um and they say and we're going to come and kill you and hang you with an agility ladder and now i'm anxious so i wasn't anxious and now yeah. i am yeah. and, the, and what and the thing that's changed that is some thinking experience is you've had an experience that's made that has, that has caused an anxious feeling and so what but it's okay so but so but you're saying it they they are causally linked there was no anxiety now there is so you're saying that's come from within though the the feeling of anxiousness has come from within it's come from within because you, stimulus. you could have read that tweet and gone ha 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 those people at agility ladders they're so bloody incompetent then there's no way they're going to be able to do that they won't be able to catch me they're not agile they won't be able to catch me they're not <laughs> agile enough and you could have laughed at it and then you wouldn't have felt anxious oh uh, yeah but i was i'm fearful now because they're going to come after me yeah, because you've had an anxious experience and then you've had another thought so that experience has passed through mm-hmm. and then you've had the experience of nah they're not very agile those people they're never going to get me <laughs> and that experience stops you feeling an- anxious Hmm. but i I still can't what is it what what is it that knows this is this is the key so are you your experience what what is it that knows the feeling of anxiety what is it that knows the feeling of of fear what is it that knows it's that there it's like the eyes shut eyes closed you 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 were having the experience of not being anxious Hmm. and then you were having the experience of being anxious Mm mm-hmm are you both of those feelings or are you what knows those feelings? Well, I assume you're going to, you, you, you're going to say that I, I am, I am what knows those feelings. Or are you saying I am those feelings? Oh, the internet's dropped. Oh, oh there you go. Back there, mate. I've got you. Sorry. Don't worry. That's fine. Um, so, so I'm saying, I was the, what I was saying was, um, I'm assuming you're going to say that I am, I'm either, well, I don't know. I don't know whether I am those feelings or I am knowing, I, I know those feelings or I know. Well, of well, well, so, well, that's the nub of it, mate. That's like the, as I say, that's the eyes shut or the eyes open. Your experience has changed. Are you your experience? Who you really are? Are you your experience or are you what knows your experience? Are you um, what knows anxiety or are you anxiety? So, you, if, and, and for me... I don't know the answer to that question and I also don't know why that matters. Because if you, if you know that you are awareness... Mm can awareness be harmed can your awareness be harmed by a death threat no but that doesn't make any difference because i still feel the feeling yeah but the as as i say you are not the feeling you are what knows the feeling yes you know the feeling so it's like the fight in the room again so are you are you the fight in the room or are you the space in the room in which that fight is taking place Hmm. yes so you are you have had the experience of a death threat are you the death threat are you the are you what what are you the feeling of getting that death threat or are you what knows the death threat what what, the awareness of that experience yeah and the awareness yeah 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 and can awareness be harmed by anything so if somebody came up to you right now and stuck a knife into you, your body would, would have a reaction to that, but you would still be the awareness of what was happening to you. Yes. And that awareness, that awareness isn't harmed by what's happening to your body. No, but again, that I, I'm struggling to. Mate, of... I got, I, th- this is, this is a curious, we're, I think we've gone down a bit of a cul-de-sac with this. I know. Go on, say what you ask what you were going to ask. Well, the, I'm this, bring, bring it back to reality again, right? Yeah. So I used the analogy of the death threat, but let me bring yeah. it back into a real sporting you know, analogy. Yeah. There's a young person. Yeah. And uh, 
they're having an experience called yep. sport. Yep. And at some point, the experience changes, and the and their experience called sport is asking them to do sport in such a way that it brings about an outcome which can elicit various feelings yep now to some that you know some just look at that and go well i'll just be i'll just be me i'll do my thing and it'll be fine and i'll just be and the performance emerges right others they have an expert they have that experience and either because of a they haven't previously had that experience so they've got no way of of making sense of it or even understanding it and that, so that 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 experience elicits thoughts feelings emotions yeah and those thoughts feelings emotions are crippling yeah and and so the individual then begins a process of seeking or resisting trying to control yeah. and they are sold you know this narrative of oh you need to learn to control and this is control, where you say yeah. tools don't work yeah i don't know if I, I i think we were maybe talking about a different language when we said tools i yeah. think tools do work but they work in a certain way the tools that normally are given like for example let's say a i'm in danger of you know i'm not a trained psychologist right but right me neither mate don't worry yeah yeah, i know but um and i know there are trained psychologists out there who might be listening to this um and and uh, who will they'll have turned off at this point mate don't worry they'll they'll have a lot they'll be long no no they won't (laughs) they'll be listening because they're curious bunch who might be thinking hang on a second mate you are messing with stuff now you really need to think of it but let's say for example at all like visualization or self-talk which are commonly used tools right and the and what those tools do is they say right well you know you can basically talk yourself into the right state or you can visualize yourself into a great performance and therefore you can be in the state to perform i'm i've always been if i'm honest slightly um uh skeptical no not skeptical i've been more than slightly skeptical about that idea so those sorts of tools in my opinion i'm i'm not convinced of their success maybe i just never did, done them properly maybe i don't understand them properly i'm perfectly happy to accept that and any psychologist is free to come on and tell me why i'm all, why i'm wrong about that but what i mean by a tool is um a, a, a way of thinking or sorry a way of interpreting experience or a way of helping an individual to i guess understand experience in a way yeah. where yeah. they don't necessarily need it doesn't it doesn't need to cripple them it doesn't yeah, you're need, on the right track with that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. i'm saying but you see often it's a it's not something i think people can just do otherwise we'd all do it no i look again i think we're at slightly cross purposes here so so to my what you're saying there is right helping somebody understand the true nature of their experience mm will help everybody mm-hmm. absolutely that, that's a that's a universe this is this is this is my key point which is for something to be true it has to be universal it has to be the same for every single human being mm-hmm. and I, there are no tools or techniques which work for that would be my definition of a tool or technique if it's a tool or a technique it works for some of the people some of the time yeah if it's understanding it works for all of the people all of the time yeah it's, it's universal so so helping helping a young person see that they that their that their feelings do not come from outside that will help every single person on this planet and they, they don't might, they, they might don't not have, feel, go on go no no so what you're going to say and they don't have to they're not forced to feel absolutely a way about something perfect Brilliant. because of yeah. what comes from the outside absolutely so so helping somebody understand that is universal giving somebody a, a, a coping technique or a visualization or a routine or a mantra or an affirmation might help some people some of the time but again how can we say that there's a causal relationship between that tool or technique and the feeling or the performance that it elicits Mm. if if it doesn't 
work in the same way for everybody all the time, then it's not, a, it's not a cause. There's no causal relationship there. It's a correlation. Yeah. I, I, I was talking about a tool in a slightly different way. They're the band-aids that I'm, I'm skeptical of. Right. Yeah. I see them as band-aids, but, yeah. but I still feel like a tool, which is, um, I, I used this phrase when we spoke last time, which is, you know, it's almost like a gateway or it's a, it's a landing point, which enables an individual to con- reconnect yeah if they've if they've been knocked off the path so shall we say yeah. then it's a way of them i guess having that moment of realization i keep using this word lens but... yeah no i like that i, I don't have a problem I, to me to me coaching is about stripping away stuff that isn't true because when you strip away stuff that isn't true you'll eventually end up at what is true and i think you're your you know if if you want to use your lens analogy it's about you know those little you know like the visors that the the the, the rip-offs that the formula one drivers use on the front of their helmets yeah, yeah. what you're doing as a coach is just ripping off layer after layer after layer of of stuff until you get to what's true because that, that's what that's what happens is that's a really good analogy i love it so the 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 tear off visors get increasingly um occluded yeah because of the experience because of experience that's experience a, I love that. is, yeah it sticks on the visor and that yeah. stops us from seeing clearly beautiful and then you you know you so you have a, a tool or something that en- enables, enables you ripping Absolutely. and now we have more clarity again that Back is the, the nature meta- of being metaphor of the week that is i love that (laughs) salmon stews metaphor of the week (laughs) borrowed from f1 (laughs) (laughs) yeah look as i say the the mate you could say that you know you again we're, we're getting into semantics so you could say that language was a tool you could get you could say that um sorry daisy's just jumped on the go on danny go danny go um you, you could say that language was a tool. You could say, you, you know, that, I don't know, language is kind of the, the, the major tool that we've got in terms of helping, helping somebody to have a realisation. Inadequate as it is. <laughs> it's the best we've got, unfortunately. You know, the, as I say, the, you, you know, a lot of people say the best way to point to the understanding that we're pointing to here is to say nothing. Yeah. Um, because whenever you try and put it into words, you've missed it because it's formless. It's not form. Yeah. So, so yeah, t- to me, as I say, the art of coaching is to, is to help somebody strip away whatever it is, is getting in the way of their true potential of their true being of, of who they really are. Yeah, and, and so in the past, you you know, you, you and I have also had conversations about like, um, you know, my my point around environments and environments essentially providing an experience. So mm. my, my view has always been, and I think this is this is where we are probably more aligned than than we think. Um, the assumption is, and the assumption has often been, that um, I create an environment and I manipulate an environment in order to bring about a behavioural change. So I'm, pas- I'm basically doing something to someone. Yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> it happens that people behave differently, yeah. but I don't do it for that reason. What I do is I manipulate the environment so that they can see the world differently. Yeah, they, you create a change in perception. That's exactly. what you're doing. So yeah. then they now have different informational cues coming to them, yeah. which they can make sense of. It still makes sense of in different ways. Um, and they can still they can still act. They still have agency to act in different ways within that. Yeah. But my point is is that the the manipulation of the of the environment is not to somehow you know it being a Machiavellian like a puppeteer you know uh, you know oh I'm going to make you dance my dance by moving yeah. this thing around which is I think what some people do. Yeah. Um, it's to say no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the environment. And it's going to present you with a new a new puzzle, a new problem, or a new way of, or it's going to provide you with new information sources that then you, you can use those information sources to determine what might or might not be a course of action that might help you with the uh, whatever the outcome or the. Um, yeah the game is asking you to do yeah. um, 
And in this case, it's sort of similar because the tool I talk about is, for example, it's a, uh, not, not a manipulation, but it's kind of a, it's a way of altering perception. Yeah. Helping someone with an alter, uh, altering their perception of what's happening in the experience. Yeah. You're, 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 cre- you're, you're, you're encouraging somebody to have a different experience if mm. you want to, if you want to put it like that. And that's absolutely the, the, the problem comes is where coaches do that a with a particular outcome in mind or a particular behavior in mind and also if they if they believe that as i say there's a causal relationship between that change in the environment and and then how somebody feels or or how somebody behaves because you could make you could you could change that environment in a game and half the players on the pitch would feel one way and do one thing and half the players would feel different and do another thing so it, it's it's there's it, again we're looking at correlation not cause uh, yes exactly and and also that's the important point there as well is that um the fact that the players perceive the informational cues in different ways it's not a bad thing no and again this is where as coaches i think we have to disabuse ourselves of the idea that there's a right way yeah and this is part that. this goes back to the narrative there's the right way to perform there's the right way to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we have this. Yeah. It's very pervasive. It's everywhere. It's very, very, very subtle. Yeah. But it's, it, these cues and these messages are bombarding people, particularly very susceptible young people, continuously. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's if we, as I'm an environmentalist, you know, or an ecologist, if you like, um, if we can try and align uh, our environmental space to say that there isn't a right way. There's just a way. And I agree with that. But what I would say is if you can, if you can have an understand, if a coach does that from an understanding of how his experience is created and how the player's experience is created, that's going to be a much more productive and fulfilling experience for everybody than it is if he's living in the illusion that his well-being and that of the players is coming from what's happening outside now that feels to me like a really really good place for us to have landed (laughs) and i'm i am grateful to you for helping and helping me on this journey of um difficult self-realization um and putting up with my clumsy language and and skepticism um, mate please don't apologize because this is the journey that again i'm i'm we're all we're all on we're all on this path it's it's and and you know i'm my colleagues we're we're in and out we're not seeing this clearly all the time we're in and out of it we're living in the same illusion that everybody else is living in it's, it's you know it's that's that's the way that human beings are mm. um, but as I say, if we can help, particularly coaches, because I believe that co- coaches are in such a they're, they're in a position to to, to have a such there's, such there's such a massive opportunity right now to to help people to make a difference because people are starting to see through the illusion more and more. We're starting to see that success and wealth and fame doesn't bring well-being. People, people are seeing that and they're asking, they're asking the obvious question, well, what's going on there? Why is that? Mm. And if we look in this direction, we can come up with, with good answers for them. If we, look, if we just, as I say, stay caught in the illusion and we continue to look outside, then we'll, we'll continue to, to lose people. I mean, I'm. I feel like I'm probably going to go too far now, but um, <laughs> I, I see it almost as as, as a anyway. You know, as I'm obviously interested in in the whole idea of skill acquisition, uh, not actually skill acquisition. I mean skill attunement. I actually I actually sit, feel like this sits really closely to that as, as being something that is skillful in the sense that if we take the idea of attunement, which is um, becoming increasingly adept at uh um attending to uh relevant information that that supports uh 
uh, our our objective let's say in a sports yeah. context there's a similarity here probably not a perfect one but a similarity which is we're attuned we're attuning we're increasing we become increasingly attuned to the experiential challenge that could take us away from that place of well-being as you've described it mm. and as we become more attuned to that it we're enable it stops us being so easily buffeted by the wind yeah. of of experience yeah i'd go along with that so the more the more the more we the the more we trust and intuit and know that we are the knowing of our experience not our experience the more resilient the more loving the more productive the more peaceful the more capable we're likely to be and that you know that to me is is if if that's all we do as coaches is point people to that then whether somebody's good at getting a ball in a hole with a stick um kind of you know yeah that's that's nice but it's 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 a bonus it's not the be all and end all and and that might and i and i stress might also correlate with us uh producing some of our best performances indeed. Mm. indeed right so uh that is a uh really good conversation and i've learned a lot i'm so look i know you're out there and you're getting and you're, you're busy <laughs> i know you're doing lots of stuff uh helping people with these conversations like you've just done with me um i'm certain there are going to be some curious individuals who would like to find out more how do they do so um you can email me at uh, sam at samjarmangolf.com. Uh, I'm, twit- I'm on Twitter at, at samjarmangolf, um, or the website is um, uh, samjarmangolf.com. And I mentioned the book so, earlier on, if people are looking yeah. to get hold of that. Uh, it's called The Three Principles of Outstanding Golf. Um, as, as you know, with stuff that you write, it's... Um, that's where I was two years ago. The, the new book will be out hopefully before Christmas. So, um, yeah, that's kind of more up to date. And I think I, I can probably, um, uh, I'll, I'll probably want to say, although it's called the three principles of outstanding golf, you could just as easily, um, uh, take away the word golf and apply life. Yeah. Sport. Mate, that, that, if, if that's Any the domain. one thing, yeah, if the, if that's the one thing that, w- that we, that we take away from today is that human beings are human beings, whatever sport they play, the, the understanding that we're pointing to is universal. So, um, the principles will, will, will apply whatever we, whatever we're doing in the world of form really. So Sam, I appreciate you coming on. Thank Mate, you for your time. Thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, for hanging in there with me. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's definitely worth it. Cheers, bud. Speak soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. Wow, heavy stuff there. We really got into some uh, some really detailed and uh, I think pretty pretty profound areas there that uh, you could probably hear through that entire conversation. Me, essentially, virtually and actually <coughs> and actually in reality, scratching my head um, as I was trying to get to grips with some of the concepts. One of the challenges, of course, being that. You know, thinking about this stuff is part of the problem um, because we're trying to make sense of it with with a a rational sense and that isn't necessarily helping us to tap into our feelings and intuitions as well as we could do. I'm sure there's much more more to this and uh, it's definitely an area of of discussion that I want to go down further and it's an area of of study that I want to explore more. I've definitely been dabbling in this area and trying to uncover more in in my quest for new ways of... um, 
helping people on their journey of, uh, of development, improvement, whatever it might be. Just and, and part of that might be actually to uh, to de-emphasize the external stuff and to start to emphasize their internal monologue, maybe in, in more ways. Um, I probably butchered that entire conversation completely, but uh, anyway, you know where I'm going from. Uh, uh, Sam, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and share your thoughts and ideas. As always, it's uh, it's interesting to debate and discuss some of these things, and it's definitely opened my eyes to a different way of thinking. Um, for all of you out there, uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation and uh, some of these ideas may uh, inspire you in some ways to engage those young athletes that you're working with in different ways. Um, in the meantime, I do hope you have a good week of coaching and remember, ditch those drills. <laughs>